Hi, my name's Phil, I like talking about politics. And in this video, I'd like to follow on from my initial video on the sacking of 800 British ferry workers with a look at some more details emerging, including the wholly unsurprising news that the UK government were given advance notice of the action and, and didn't actually do anything. But first, if you'd like to be notified of daily news and politics, please subscribe to the channel and click the bell notification icon. So uh, let me recap the relevant part of the story last week about the entire British fleet of P&O ferry workers being instantly sacked. We were told they were instructed to return to port. Again, very suddenly, they were told that their jobs were gone via a video conference. Uh, we were also told that their foreign replacements were waiting in coaches at the port. Now, it's that last bit that was the most shocking because you've got coach loads of, what, undocumented foreigners? waiting to take up work at the largest port in the UK and border force weren't asking them a lot of awkward questions? I'm not sure that made a lot of sense unless the government knew about them already. Then a Conservative minister in an interview admitted knowing about the sackings but didn't tell the public. Uh, then on Saturday, the Times published an article with further damning details of the skullduggery at play here. But before I get onto that, I'm also going to point out that local Tory MP Natalie Elphick uh, attended a demonstration in support of the sacked ferry workers. She tried to say, yeah, it's terrible, isn't it? Absolutely outrageous. And there's nothing unusual in that, you may think. Local MP stands in support of a load of workers who've clearly been treated very shoddily indeed. You know, only just last year, however, Labour put forward a motion that would have made fire and rehire unlawful. And although this was much worse than fire and rehire, this is just fire on the spot, it was the principle of a law designed to prevent workers being sacked without competence being an issue for a job that still exists. You know, and, and Natalie Elphick voted against this proposal. And do you know what? The protesters surrounding her knew of her voting record and loudly said so. And I cannot emphasise just how important this is. The core message of this video is that the Conservatives do not care about your jobs. You may think, well, I don't work on a ferry. This goes beyond ferry workers. This is every employee in the country. You know, the Conservatives want a society where bosses are free to hire and fire as they please, according to their own whims, with zero protections for workers. The argument keeps coming back, oh, well, businesses have to work in these cycles and it's not conducive to having permanent staff that they can't just get rid of when they suddenly don't need them anymore. Completely forgetting what we actually need in society. But anyway... Leave that for later. Let's get back to that article in the Times. So, the Times, I remind you, being a conservative supporting right-wing paper. You know, the opening paragraph was of senior civil servants telling ministers that the move would mean P&O remains a key player in the UK market. A nonsense of an argument, of course. We only want businesses involved in the UK market if we get some benefit from it. This, this assumption that just a company being a part of our market is automatically good. You know, think about how this new P&O will impact the UK market. So first of all, it will have zero British employees. That's basically what we're saying. They'll all be foreign. It will include French workers, of course, because they can't sack those. But the point is, it will not include British workers. So there's no direct benefit in terms of jobs, is there? In addition, P&O itself is a foreign-owned business. As I said in my previous video, the majority shareholders of the group are the royal family of the UAE. So profits don't even remain in the country. You know, so, so what benefit do we derive from a foreign-owned ferry operator employing exclusively foreign workers? And you can argue there are some extra benefits. You know, they'll presumably pay something in taxes. Um, benefits for linked businesses. And we're an island, so we'll benefit from the ferries in facilitating trade. And this is all true. But the problem with that thinking is we'd still get those benefits if the government opposed this latest move. You know, the government going along with these sackings doesn't actually get us those things. We'd have had them anyway. We did have them. If the government had made this action unlawful or had taken political action, like suspending the operating licences of the parent company in the UK, then we'd still get those benefits, plus those workers would retain their jobs. But P&O were complaining that their business model with British workers is unsustainable. So how come it's sustainable for French workers then? Also... Who is allowing P&O to operate in the UK whilst employing Colombians for way less than the minimum wage? You know, why do we have a position where a company can choose to pay 
you know, foreign workers at much less than the fee they'd have to pay for British equivalents. Isn't that part of the problem here as well? And that's a problem that goes beyond the UK as well in Europe. But what if P&O decided to abandon the business around Britain altogether? Well, we're an island. We need those ferries. So either another business would step in or the government would have to nationalise the service as they have for parts of our rail network, for example. Bear in mind, we know that the Conservatives like to privatise everything. But the Conservatives have actually nationalised a few things, on the quiet, of course, since they came to power. You know, no matter how you look at this, the only reason P&O can get away with this is because the government allowed them to. Not had no option, not got boxed into a corner, allowed them to. So then we come to the difference between EU and UK law. Now, this action is clearly unlawful in, in EU law. Easy to look that up. There have been suggestions that it is unlawful in the UK. But here's the thing. I've not actually heard anyone that's an expert in employment law definitively say this is definitely unlawful uh, as it's been done. Uh, it's, it's, it's certainly not clear. And if it is unlawful, and you certainly hope some aspects of it were, how seriously is it unlawful? Is it just a tribunal job? You know, technically it's unlawful, so the workers will demand compensation and a court will award them some compensation, but it'll just amount to, what, a few months' salary? In which case, the company appears to be ready to pay that. They don't care. It doesn't stop them sacking the workers still. Like in France, the government would remove their operating licences for all businesses connected to the group, just straight away. All there is to it. The UK government could do likewise. The parent company has dollar signs in its eyes for the free ports that the government keeps banging on about, which is actually in reality another device designed to pay workers less and billionaires more. In fact, as a result of the public backlash, the article reports that Transport Secretary Grant Shapps has ordered a review into the operating licences. I'm not fooled. They're going to carry out their review. It'll take place over a long enough period of time that this all blows over. Then they'll conclude it's in the UK's interest to maintain those licences. After all, if the government really wanted to take action, and given that they'd missed the opportunity to have robust laws against it this time, they would not review the licences like this. They'd say to this company, you've got 30 days, then your licences are all suspended in the UK. That would be that. They can, sure, they can order a review later on to see, you know, whether it was the right decision, but they would make the decision first and then worry about it later. You know, like they often do. They always do this. But despite the mock outrage from ministers, it is clear they knew about it in advance and did nothing. Like, didn't even try to stop it. It's not just that they didn't stop it. The report says they made no effort to persuade P&O to change its mind or even delay the move, as far as I can tell. You know, the, the, it's like the government were told, oh, P&O are going to sack 800 workers tomorrow. And the ministers just went, right, is that supposed to be important to me? I, what's it got to do with me? The government expressed not one iota of concern about this event until the public backlash came. And it got worse. The company is reported in this article to be threatening redundancy payments. You know, if you go and talk to the media, you won't get any redundancy payments. Well, hang on a minute. Well, isn't there a legal issue around that as well? You can't just decide whether or not you pay redundancy. Also, there's a risk that somehow the British public will have to bail out the company's pension fund to the tune of £146 million. How is that possible? Now, the last bit isn't certain. It is just a risk. The article did report that P&O said it would honour its commitments. But the fact that we'd be relying, relying upon it honouring its commitments is ridiculous. And this is a company who just sacked 800 competent workers on the spot. Do we really trust them to honour anything? Now, consider this. P&O sack 800 workers, immediate effect. This is disruptive. So it also means that the largest ferry operator for our island nation, dependent upon ferries, has to do without service for up to two weeks on some crossings. Instead of the government saying, this is an appalling way to treat our citizens and it is creating a major barrier to trade, almost as big as our hard Brexit has done, so we are suspending your licences and we'll get some decent companies in to handle our needs or else organise a nationalised organisation to do so. No, instead they defend p and decision. And they do so because they are wholly on the side of the bosses. Not that they are neutral, as, as the government could be, and they'll stand up for the side who's in the right in cases of industrial disharmony and just to decide, well, actually, who's in the right here? No, no, no. Entirely always on the side of the bosses. They want a UK market where bosses are free to hire and fire as they please on whatever basis they deem best for their business. You know, this is not only immoral, but it is also economic madness. Now, consider this. 
because if you don't really care about the morality, say. How can a society function without job security? It's the workers who spend their income in the British economy. It's not wealthy foreign shareholders, is it? The crown prince of the United Arab Emirates isn't spending a lot in this country, is he? That's not filtering through to the British economy. No, but the British workers do because they live here. And they'll spend, as a proportion of their income, almost all of it. Because most salaried workers are going to actually spend almost all of their money in this country. And if you want workers to spend their money, you need to give them the confidence that they are free to do so without the fear of impending insolvency. Imagine what happens if, as a country, we're tuned on to the idea that our boss can sack us at any moment. Back to, like, Victorian times. It's like you can come in one day, find your sack. For whatever reason, the boss just doesn't like you or they've decided they've found someone better or cheaper or whatever, they're getting rid of you. Not an issue of competence, not an issue of anything. They just You're just gone. You had no idea. Immediate. You, you'll be paid for the previous day and that's it. That's it. In a situation like that, you have to make sure you, you cannot spend on luxuries. So you will have to cut back and make sure you've got at least a few months money to keep you afloat to try and find a new job. In a situation like that, in a background like that, particularly with suppressed wages, you cannot afford to spend on things you don't really need. Imagine the impact on the economy of that sort of attitude. But also think about what this government reaction means. It means that the government will not lift a finger to save anyone's jobs. Not one single worker in this country is safe. Yes, we still have some employment laws and maybe they will safeguard some of you for now. But the more that the large corporations particularly start to see that the government won't really do anything, the more they'll be emboldened to carry out more acts like this. The government have made clear their opposition to workers' rights. Allow them to remain in power and they'll all be gone. Then your only hope will be having a good union. And some good unions are very good. But some are rubbish. Of course, then the government will target the unions, won't they? But those are my thoughts. Let me know yours in the comments below. Hope you found the video interesting. If you did, don't forget to click the like button. And if you'd like to support the channel further, please also click the Patreon link for details. And until next time, I'll see you later.